So another quick fire. So thresholds. Let's try and do thresholds in ten minutes. It's um, um, an important concept to get across, um, and it'll maybe take a, a little while when you, you're actually playing with your own um, uh, with your own data uh, and, and no models to, to really understand how changing the threshold affects your predictions and that. But um, just want to get across to you the idea of, of, of what the threshold is, and, and so you can kind of go away and, and start playing with it. So many of these um, methods that we're working with, um, the, the GARP results that, that you're literally right now processing, and the, um, the MAPSEND models that, that, that we ran uh, an hour or so ago, um, give you not just a binary prediction of kind of suitable or, or not suitable, or if you like, present or absent as a, as a prediction. They give you some sort of suitability surface, uh, an index of suitability, or uh, as we were kind of saying in, in the max n sense, it, it really is a, a, a probability surface. Um, so here's a, here's a classic example of, of the kind of um, result that you might get. This just is for a, a, a salamander in, in North America that we, that we had a quick go with. So the question is, how might we, and I'll come on to why might we, but first of all, how might we, turn this into actually a binary prediction of present or absent. So we need to set some sort of threshold that says above a certain prediction, above a certain value of the prediction, we're going to say the environment is suitable or is within the ecological niche. And below that value, we're going to say the environment is unsuitable, it's outside the ecological niche. <clears throat> And you'll, you'll see that there's some crossover here with, with what we talk about tomorrow morning in terms of evaluation statistics. There's, there's definitely a crossover. But what we do is, it's really part of the model calibration process. We set this threshold based on the data that was used to build the model. So this is before we evaluate it. We don't use the data that we've kept out to, to test the model. We use the, the calibration data set. And we can use simple plots like this. So what this is saying, so, so this is a case of, suppose we only have presence data, okay? As, as is what we're mostly working with. We can do a, a, a simple chart like this, where we say, well, here's, here are the range of possible thresholds. So suppose this is, say, a, a prediction from GARP, or, or some other algorithm that gives you a prediction from zero to 100, okay? So zero would be low suitability, and 100 would be high suitability. This could be zero to one if it was a max end prediction zero probability up to a probability of one. Okay? So what's going to happen? What we're then doing is plotting on our y-axis the emission rate. So this is the, the proportion of the points that are emitted from the prediction. In effect, they are incorrectly predicted. So they fall outside the prediction. When we literally draw this on a map, they fall in areas that are not predicted to be present. So what's going to happen as we increase the threshold, as we move along the, uh, along the suitability score this way, from 0 to 100? Well, first of all, what's going to happen to the area that's predicted present, the geographic area that's predicted present? It's going to shrink, right? So as we increase that threshold, we start from 0, then 1, then 2, all the way up to 50, to 70, to 80, to 100. The area that we're predicting present is going to, sh is going to shrink. Because to be classed as present or, or suitable, you have to be above that threshold. So the higher the threshold is, the lower number of cells are going to fall above that threshold. So as we, as we move um, from left to right, as we're looking at it, we increase this threshold, then the area that's predicted present is going to shrink. So what's going to happen to our emission rate? The number of the presence points, the occurrence records that we calibrated the model on, What's going to happen to the proportion of those that are um, left out of the model? I'm not going to wait for answers because it's here and we'll push for time. Of course, it's going to increase, right? The area gets smaller, so the number of points that fall within that area um, decreases. You begin to kind of lose a few around the edges, all right? Until by the time you've set your threshold as extraordinarily high, then you've basically you've left all of your um, points out of, of the prediction. Okay? So what can we do with this kind of problem? Well, we can therefore look at this and start making some sensible decisions about what thresholds we might use. One that is sometimes termed the lowest present threshold, or the minimum presence threshold, or the mean, minimum training presence, 
um, different terms, but it's essentially saying, let's take the value that is associated that with the, the, sorry, let's take the lowest value, the lowest prediction that is associated with an occurrence record. Okay? So what that's going to do is mean that all of our occurrence records are predicted present, right? So the emission rate is zero. So in effect, we're going to take the highest um, threshold value, which is going to give us the smallest area where we don't leave any of our points out. So in effect, what we're going to do is shrink the area, shrink, 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 shrink until we've reached the limit of, if we shouldn't get any further, we'll start leaving some points out. Okay? So the simplest way of doing that, you know, if you've got 100 points, you can just pull out the values that are associated with them, rank them, and take the bottom one. Okay? And if you use that value as a threshold, then you're going to get the smallest area that incorporates all of your occurrence records. Okay? Then we might start doing other things. We might set an emission rate. Okay, and Enrique talked about this just now, and talked about this yesterday as well, is this term E, which is your kind of acceptable error rate, if you like. What, what proportion of the occurrences am I willing to leave out? So if you have a data set that maybe you've downloaded a thousand records from GBF, you're, you're suspecting a few of them, some of them are probably um, the georeferencing was wrong, some of them might be incorrect species IDs, then you might be willing to accept some emission. Again, we've talked about values like 10% emission. But some of the work that I've shown you from Madagascar, which we've been very careful, we only have 20 occurrence records say we know that the georeferencing is correct. You know, we're working with the folks who actually took those data in the field. We know that the species IDs are correct because we've got the type of specimens, or we've got the specimens themselves, we um, are working with the folks who, who, who know the species extremely well. So we have high confidence in, in our data. So in that case, we might not let any emission Okay, so we might use this threshold of what I'm terming here, the, the LBT, or the lowest presence threshold. But if we are willing to accept some emission, then we can set a threshold that say, says, well, let's, let's accept 20% emission and take the threshold that's associated with that. I guess the example here is pretty high. It's really accepting 30 or 35% emission. It's just conceptual. But you see the principle. By increasing the threshold, we reduce the predicted area when we think spatially or, or, or in ecological niche space, the niche gets smaller, which means that we emit more points. Okay? So we're starting to make sensible decisions based on our understanding of the data and the, the species and the landscape as to what threshold might be appropriate in a particular circumstance. Now it's less usually done, but I'm going to show you a case um, later in the week where we actually take the threshold the other way. We actually reduce the threshold to just predict slightly more area. Okay? This is the example that, that I'll come back to where we're actually using the models to guide field surveys. So we don't want to even shrink to the few occurrence records that we have. We want to be a little bit more generous and start saying, well, what, what's a slightly more, a larger area that might be sensible to go actually and, 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 and start visiting to, to look for species? So in that case, we might actually reduce the threshold a little bit to predict a slightly larger area. Okay, so these are simple thresholds that we can use based on this very straightforward plot of a mission rate. And you'll see that some of the tools that we're using, MaxN for instance, gives you some of these values. You don't actually need to do this yourself, but in practice you've set the computer to say, set a threshold of, you know, 0 0.01, what's the emission rate, 0.02, all the way up to, to, to the maximum prediction. Um, secondly, sometimes as we've talked about, we might have um, absence data, or we might have some sort of pseudo-absence or, or background data, and we might therefore int be interested in not just asking how well are we doing with our presence data, but also how, how well are we doing with our absence data. Um, and there are some neat approaches that can be used then. This is a very similar plot. This is actually a prediction from a, a MaxSent model, so it goes from zero to one, that's our probability. We're going to interpret that like a, a threshold here. Um, this is our index of, of how well the models are doing, and it, it's, 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 it's two different things depending on which curve we're looking at. But if we just look at this curve, this is the proportion of the absences that are correctly predicted. Okay, it's, it's kind of, it, it's following the same pattern as the emission rate, and I'm not just using the same terms each time because you'll see different ways of looking at the same data in the literature. So this, is, this curve here is, is, is in effect the opposite of, of the emission rate. This is the proportion of the presences that 
that's correctly predicted. So as we increase the threshold, the amount of suitable area shrinks again. So what happens? The proportion of the presences that are correctly predicted decreases. More of them are left out. The emission rate goes up, or the proportion that you're getting correct goes down. And by, by contrast, the proportion of the absences that are correctly predicted is going to increase because more of the absences are going to be left outside the prediction as the prediction shrinks, which means that the, you know, the proportion of the absences are going to um, uh, increase. So have, have, have a little bit more of a think about, about these kind of um, uh, plots and, 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 and you can have a look at some of your data. But in effect, what we're doing here then is asking, well, how well are we doing with the presences? And how well are we doing with the absences as we change the threshold? And then we can use some criteria like, well, let's balance the two. Let's look at where those two graphs cross and say, well, let's, let's take a, a kind of midway in terms of, well, let's make sure that we're doing as best that we can in terms of the balance between how well we're doing with the presences and how well we're doing with the absences. We might do something like um, uh, look, look at the sum of, 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 those two, of those two values. But you see, in principle, we're asking, What's the balance between how well we're doing with the presences and how well we're doing with the, with the absences? Once we've decided on a value, so in this case, you know, we might, that, that value might be, or in this case, an, an extremely high value. I should emphasize that, you know, we, we've talked an awful lot about the differences between presences and absences and how we weight them differently. So, I would have some reservations in, in a lot of cases of, of just using the balance between the two of them because um, we don't think that the, the, the errors of, of prediction or, or, or omission and commission are, are equal. Um, but, but in principle, what we're going to do is, is take some value of the threshold. So it might be you know, 0.7 or, or, or thereabouts, or it might be um, 0.25, or, or in this case, you know, 24, whatever your, your, your index of suitability is or probability. Take that value, and then we're simply going to do a kind of a, a, a reclass in your GIS. So in, in, in QGIS or in, in, in ArcMap, you can do a reclass um, to say basically above this threshold, above this value, we're going to say that we're going to class the, the, the environment as, as suitable or within the niche, and below this value, we're going to class the, the, the environment as, as unsuitable. So um, there is exactly the same model salamander that we showed before. This one, but applying this minimum train presence, um, uh, which was the, the, this threshold here. The actual value in, in this case isn't, isn't terribly important. We're not looking at the actual value. But we took this value, we then just reclassed the output, and that's our thresholded result. Okay. So that's all thresholds are. They're, they're, they're intuitive, reasoned ways of deciding what that value is that dis distinguishes if you like, present from absent or, or within the niche from not within the niche. So my, why might you want to do this? Well, plenty of reasons, in effect, for not doing it. And, and, and the key thing that's, that's in red at the bottom here is only set a threshold if you really need to. We need to think about it and understand it. You'll see when we come to talk about evaluation statistics tomorrow, because the way that the ones that we're going to talk about work, they, they require an understanding of setting thresholds. We're going to come to that tomorrow. So it's important that you understand the principles. But in effect, what you're doing is, is, is ditching information. You're throwing out information. You're taking this probability surface or this index, and you're just converting it to binary yes or no, zeros and ones. So there is an element of um, throwing out information. So only do this if you need to do it, if you have reason to do it. Some of those reasons might be simply for visualization. Often when trying to visualize, particularly if you have multiple species, um, and you're looking at things like the, the potential for overlap um, between two, say, closely related species or something, it can be quite um, intuitive to, to visualize those distributions in a binary sense rather than trying to look at, at probability surfaces or, or, or indexes of, of suitability. And often if you're, you may be presenting this work to, um, uh, to, to managers or to practitioners who are less well versed in understanding the, the, the ins and outs of these methods and it might be more convenient to, to actually make a, a decision based on some 
uh, some simple statistics as to what's suitable and what's unsuitable, rather than leaving that to some more subjective um, decision, um, you know, outside your control, if you like. So there might be some reasons for for strategically setting the threshold based on, on some criteria from a from a, a management perspective. Um, there might be an element, you know, there, there is some, there's some good work that's been done looking at um, species richness, for example, so building models for a whole bunch of species and then, in effect, layering them on top of each other. There are a number of examples like that where it makes sense to set a threshold. Um, um, and, and as I've said, it, it, it's really important that understanding some of the evaluation statistics. So we'll talk tomorrow about binomial tests required to set a threshold. We'll talk to you tomorrow about um, the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve requires you to set a threshold to understand where the curve comes from, but a key thing is that it's a measure of predictive performance without setting a threshold. It actually tests how well the model is across the full range of predictions, although there are a number of complications and issues that um, in particular town will, will, will talk about tomorrow. So only set a threshold if you've got good reason. That might just be for visualizing your results, but that's a, a very quick overview of what thresholding is and why you might or might not want to do it. Coffee's arrived, but any quick questions um, on specifically on thresholding? Or any more general questions about where we're going to that we can pull in the other folks in? Does that make sense? Straightforward? I hope the blank looks mean we're ready for coffee. Let's take coffee and then we're, we're, thresholds won't just disappear because, as I said, we're going to talk about evaluation and that tomorrow morning, so this will come back. But um, uh, think up any questions, um, but for now, let's, let's have a coffee.